Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first live webinar in the Ultimate Cloud series, brought to you by AvPoint and the European SharePoint community. My name is Declan, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Mark Stokes, who will be talking to you about when do you decide to go to Office 365. Remember to join in the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag Ultimate Cloud. After the webinar, we will have questions. Type any questions you have for Mark in the question pane in the control panel. Some questions will be selected and answered at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will be notified by email when it is available. And now I'm going to pass over to our webinar presenter, Mark Stokes. Hello, Mark. Hi, Declan. Okay. Hi, hi, hi Declan. Uh, thank you very much for uh, that introduction. Okay, I assume everybody can see my, my slides now. Um, okay, yes, thank you, Declan, for, um, for inviting me to uh, talk on this series. Um, cloud's a, a topic that's very close to my heart, and we do quite a lot of work with it, so I'm, I'm very happy to uh, talk about it and give a, an introduction. Um, so, my name's uh, Mark Stokes. Um, I am a SharePoint Server MVP, um, and I run a, a, a small boutique uh, Microsoft partner in the northwest of the UK. Uh, my contact details are all up there. I won't talk too much about it because it's not very interesting. Uh, you're more interested in the, the topic I've got to talk about. Uh, one other thing to note on here, though, uh, really is um, that I also organise the Manchester SharePoint User Group uh, and get involved in sending out the, um, the, the newsletters every month as well. So uh, if anyone on here is not aware of the SharePoint User Group, then I highly recommend that you go and um, Google it and have a look and find your nearest region because um, if you're working within uh, SharePoint specifically, um, you know, it is a great source for free information, so please do go and have a look at that. Uh, my contact details are on the slides. Um, I assume Declan is going to share these um, with you afterwards as well, so if anyone does have any questions on what you've seen um, here today, please do feel free to send me an email or to uh, send me a tweet. Um, I'm more than happy to carry on talking uh, about it in the future. Okay, so a couple of the topics that we're going to look at today. Um, first of all, we're going to um, have a look at what the, the cloud actually means to us. So um, I think most people are fairly familiar with this, um, this, this term now, but I just want to go through a few sort of basic um, elements of, of what we mean when we talk about cloud. Uh, a little bit of a, a conversation around Microsoft's different cloud um, services, so Windows Azure and Office 365, a very brief, um, quick uh, slide on the difference between them. Um, I'll show you a little bit more about um, what Office 365 and SharePoint Online uh, is formed. And then we'll look at um, some more cloud specifics, so a little bit more on the things that you need to think about if you're um, looking at your cloud strategy um, uh, before you kind of make that leap. So we'll look at what the marketing tells you, we'll look at what the marketing doesn't tell you, uh, and then we'll have a little um, bit of a conversation around uh, the security and privacy, uh, the control elements, think some of the cost benefits uh, and some of the general things that you, you need to think about. So it really does kind of hopefully, uh, it doesn't answer all your questions, it just tells you the, uh, the, the elements that you need to think of and be aware of uh, before you make decisions to, to move to any cloud provider. <clears throat> and to be honest, in all reality, you can actually move the, um, the Microsoft pieces out of this and you can apply the same uh, philosophy and the same questions to any cloud provider that you are looking to go with. So first of all, uh, what does the cloud mean to us? Um, the cloud is a, uh, a great buzzword that's been around for the last uh, year or two. Um, it's not really anything new. Um, generally, the cloud um, has always been there. It's really just the internet, uh, but the internet um, has some, some uh, negative connotations and people think it's full of hackers and, and sort of nasty people who are going to do bad with your data. Uh, so I think the industry needed a bit of a new buzzword, uh, so we came up with the cloud. Now, the cloud does have some slight um, differentiators, though, to what we're commonly used to um, with internet and hosted services, um, such as uh, some of the characteristics that the, uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology define are that a cloud service, as opposed to a regular internet hosted service, um, should follow these, um, these different elements. It should be uh, on-demand self-service. They say that a consumer uh, should be able to unilaterally provision computing capabilities such as server time or network storage as needed and automatically without requiring human interaction uh, uh, from the service provider. Um, it should also have a broad network access, so the capabilities should be available over um, networks and uh, the internet uh, and access through standard mechanisms um, 
the promote use by heterogeneous thin and thick client platforms, so things like mobile phones, tablets, laptops, workstations. Um, should uh, make use of resource pooling, um, therefore this is one of the key elements of the cloud for me is the fact that um, uh, you, you share your, um, your services with other, um, other users. Therefore, you, uh, if you're looking at an on-premises or um, self-hosted solution, typically you have to design your servers and your infrastructure to, to manage um, the peaks of your system. So if you think about an exchange system uh, for email, you probably have to uh, uh, build that to allow for maybe 5,000 users all arriving at 9 o'clock in the morning downloading their emails, and then for the rest of the day, you're probably using about 20% of that server capacity, or maybe even less. So the, uh, the concept of resource pooling is a good one for efficiency and uh, environmental issues, where you're sharing those resources with other people, and then the, the peaks and troughs can be sort of shared between all the different customers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also defines rapid elasticity. Um, so the services that you use, um, you can basically scale those outwards or inwards, uh, depending on your demand. So if you're running an e-commerce site in a um, cloud, uh, a cloud-hosted service, then you may decide that around Christmas time. Uh, you have uh, far more customers than you do for the rest of the year. Therefore, you can rapidly um, add additional resources to your service to allow for that extra demand. And then once that Christmas hol or holiday period is, is finished, then you can actually pull back and, uh, and use less resources to see the demand. Uh, that quite often can be uh, set up to happen automatically as well. So if the service provider detects that um, that that there's a peak demand, then it can automatically um, assign additional resources to your service. And it should also be a measured service. Uh, so cloud services should um, automatically optimize the resources use, as we've just explained, but then they can also uh, meter the resource usage you have. So how much storage you're currently using, how many um, processor cycles you are currently using, uh, how much memory you're using, and then they can actually bill you on that per use basis. So rather than going out and buying a, a co-hosted server for maybe £500 per month, you actually just pay for the services and the resources that you've used. So those are really the characteristics that define the cloud from the traditional internet or hosted services that you might be used to. There are um, four different um, generally accepted types of cloud. Uh, so the first one is on-premises. You could argue maybe this isn't cloud, but um, users can certainly, and organizations can definitely set up their own cloud service that, that matches those characteristics we've just explained, um, but all hosted within your own data centers. That's still using cloud if it matches those characteristics. There is a concept of a private cloud. So may, uh, this means that uh, you have dedicated resources for your organization um, provided um, by some service provider, uh, and that's solely for your use. So your data is still ring fenced away, but you still match those characteristics, maybe for your other internal um, services. Uh, then we have a community cloud. Um, these the community clouds don't tend to be as popular as I think they were generally thought they might be, um, but this is where a, a group of like-minded uh, customers or organizations maybe get together and share some, um, some pooled resources. So uh, maybe some academic institutions may get together uh, where they're in a non-competitive market and actually share some, uh, some common resources for their use. Um, so they get all the benefits of it, but they also get a certain level of protection. Um, the government tends to use things like community clouds as well, so they can have all their services on a cloud environment, but they know it's, it's quite uh, well segregated away and protected for them. And then what most people are familiar with is the public cloud. This is um, services like Amazon AWS, Windows Azure, um, uh, Office 365, and this is where it's just open to the public and you share your resources with all other organizations um, that are on there. You don't know who they are, you have no control over the, who they are, and that's just more public and open. Um, so the different types of cloud offerings we have, uh, you've probably seen some of these terms float around. So the first one we have is software as a service. This is where a, uh, a solutions provider will create a, a piece of software. Uh, and this is where Office 365 sits um, or things like Salesforce uh, sits there or the SAP Online maybe sits there. And this is where you have a particular software offering uh, that you connect to. You don't own the servers it runs on, you don't control the, the rollout of it, but you just get to use that uh, piece of software um, in the way that you want. 
We then have um, infrastructure and platform as a service. This is where you get some um, basic, uh, basic services such as uh, virtual networking or uh, computing, um, virtual machine capabilities, uh, things like that, and then you actually build your uh, solutions on top of that. So think about a, uh, a, a, a website that you host there, and then they just provide all the platform or the infrastructure, and then you build on top of it with your own software. And then DAS, um, this is uh, generally defined as desktop as a service. Uh, so if you wanted to, you could actually get rid of all of your um, your sort of expensive laptops and computers, and then you could subscribe to a service that gives you a, uh, a virtual desktop um, that's hosted in the cloud. And then use some uh, some dumb terminals or cheap um, hardware to actually connect to those virtual desktops to get the capability. Um, this sounds a bit confusing. Some people do actually also use this as data as a service. Um, so sometimes there are providers who actually give you um, access to data streams um, that you can actually consume within your applications. So when we talk about the cloud, this is the the, the general consensus of what we uh, of what we think about. Okay, so moving into uh, the Microsoft world, uh, Microsoft really has um, two um, different cloud offerings. Uh, the first one is Microsoft uh, Windows Azure, uh, and this kind of fits in the uh, infrastructure and the platform as a service space. Uh, and generally here, we will go out and we will um, purchase compute time. So compute time is sort of processing time, CPU um, uh, capabilities, memory, that sort of thing. Uh, storage, so maybe we'll have some cloud storage for uh, allowing people to upload information and virtual networking as well. So we can actually build out full um, IT infrastructures um, within these cloud hosted environments. So there's a, a there's quite a big uh, move at the moment for people to move their their servers out of their own data centers and into um, cloud hosted providers. Um, it, it, it should work out more cost effective over, over the long term and people are sort of exploring that and I think people are starting to get a lot more confidence on the ability to run their networks um, in the cloud or in hybrid solutions, so part on cloud and part on premises. Microsoft Office 365, this is um, Microsoft's software as a service platform. Um, and when we are going to what Office 365 comprises at the moment, but typically it's Exchange Online, Link Online, SharePoint Online. And then there are some associated programs that don't really sit on the Office 365 banner, um, but to be honest, I think they probably should do, um, and they probably do things like Dynamic CRM, Power BI, Project Online, and Yammer. So if we go into move, uh, move into looking at what is Office 365, I'll, um, I'll give you an overview of what um, these services kind of look like and what, what you get with it, uh, and then we'll move on to some of the more um, decision factors and move into the cloud afterwards. So generally, Office 365 is a catch-all name for a, a product uh, that Microsoft sells. Uh, you get Link Online. Link Online gives you the ability to do instant messaging, desktop sharing, video conferencing, voice over IP, that kind of thing. So it kind of fits in where Skype is in a, in a more public domain, uh, where instant messaging used to uh, fit in. You also get Exchange Online, so Microsoft gives you a, a hosted email service. Um, I'm always blown away by just how much feature parity Microsoft has managed to get into Exchange Online. Um, you get pretty much most of what you get in an on-premises um, Exchange server. It's incredible what they've managed to get in there. Um, it's well worth looking at. And for every user that signs up to Office 365, Microsoft gives you a 50 gigabyte mailbox. Um, I think that's still the current stat. It change, these things change so quickly, it's difficult to keep up to date. But last time I checked, it was a 50 gig mailbox and infinite archive storage. So that's just incredible. So for me, there's no real reason not to move your email into Exchange Online these days, unless you have various security issues. But it's amazing what they've managed to actually get in, uh, into that. And to be honest, anyone who thinks a 50, 50 gigabyte mailbox is not enough, then I would seriously consider the way that you collaborate and you, uh, you manage your information, because I don't think anyone should be having 50 gigabyte mailboxes. We also get SharePoint Online. Um, we'll t I'll take an assumption that most people are familiar with SharePoint. Um, so uh, this is their, their SharePoint hosted service. Uh, we'll look at this in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, and then we also get Office Pro Plus. So if we have the correct license uh, level, then we get the ability to uh, allow our users to actually download the full 
versions of Microsoft Office. Um, it covers the majority of the Office suite. Uh, a nice thing here is that it actually gives you a, a form of software assurance built into uh, the licensing. So it, as Microsoft releases new versions of Office, then they will automatically be uh, downloaded or uh, pushed out to uh, users who sign up to Office 365. So you'll always keep up to date with the latest versions. Uh, normally you have to pay a little bit more for that software assurance uh, when you go through your licensing. Um, but those licenses to use Office, they, uh, they exist as long as your user has a, um, a license in Office 365. So it's not a perpetual license. So if you terminate your Office 365 licenses, your ability to use Office uh, goes away. So that's what people tend to think about as Office 365. However, there is an, a very important other component, which is when you create an Office 365 tenancy, you get a Windows Azure Active Directory set up for you. Um, basically, this is um, part of Windows Azure. Um, so when you create an Office 365 tenancy, you actually get a Windows, uh, Windows Azure uh, account set up for you as well under the hood, and that's where it stores all of your user information. Um, so that becomes quite powerful when you start to actually think about it a little bit further. Because if you've got a fully fledged Windows Azure account there, then you have the ability to actually host um, your own applications in there as well. And, they, and that sits on top of that same Windows Azure Active Directory element that you have. So your users that you're provisioned into Office 365, you now have a great platform for using that to authenticate and authorize users into your own applications. So you can start writing your own .NET applications or your own PHP applications or any other technology that you, you, you want to use and you want to host in that Windows Azure. So just by signing up to Office 365, all of a sudden the world starts to get a little bit bigger than you, you maybe expect. Uh, as I said before, there are some supporting services as well. So these kind of sit alongside Office 365, but the, the line between them for me gets quite blurry. Uh, so we also get access to Power BI. Uh, Dynamics CRM online. Uh, we also get Office web applications as well, so we get the ability to um, edit our Office documents such as Word and Excel and PowerPoint uh, within the browser. So maybe you, you decide some of your users don't need the full version of Office Pro Plus, then it is possible to allow them to just edit their documents within the browser. Um, it's actually quite a good experience. It's certainly not as fully fledged as the full desktop versions, um, but for a lot of people, Maybe it's just what they need. Um, also gives you, gives you some really nice co-authoring capabilities on those documents. Um, it actually works okay on iPads as well. Microsoft's doing very well at um, promoting cross um, to, uh, cross platforms these days. Um, so they're investing lots of money into iPad and uh, Android applications. And I, I use this on my iPad quite a lot uh, when I'm on the move. Um, so. When we have our users in our Windows Azure Active Directory, um, obviously one thing that some people may uh, realize at this point is, well, we already have our user account set up in our on-premises Active Directory. So we end up with a, a situation here where we have our users referenced in the cloud and our users um, referenced in our on-premises Active Directory. And they're completely unrelated. They're completely disconnected and they're separate items. So um, our users will have to go and log into our corporate desktops and then they'll have to log into Office 365 separately. And those accounts are not synchronized and they're not, um, and the passwords are not updated um, in unison. So what we have is we have the ability to deploy a couple of pieces of technology. Uh, the first one is um, uh, called DareSync, and this basically synchronizes our directories between uh, on-premises and Windows Azure. So if we create a new user in our on-premises AD, then that will push those users up to um, the Windows Azure AD, and then they can have access to Office 365. Um, this now does support a password sync, but it's not a true single sign-on. Uh, capability. So Microsoft has another piece of technology uh, which is ADFS, which is Active Directory Federation Services. And what this does, this actually allows us to reroute uh, the authentication process. So when somebody comes into Office 365 and tries to sign in, uh, ADFS will actually take that uh, authentication process and uh, move it back to the on-premises Active Directory. Um, so now we have a true single sign-on. When we ch change our user details in our on-prem, AD, then they're automatically reflected through into Office 365. It also makes it a lot easier uh, when we just open up the browser, connect to Office 365, and we have automatic login 
uh, to the services as well. Uh, there is another element then, so Yammer at the moment sits uh, pretty much outside of everything. Uh, Microsoft bought Yammer a couple of years ago for quite a lot of money. Uh, it gives them a, a lot of benefits in uh, rapid software development capability and also a, a good solid social network uh, capability. Um, at the moment, Yammer is uh, not connected into um, uh, Windows Azure authentication or Office 365. Uh, Microsoft is currently working on doing this. Uh, obviously, because they bought in a, uh, a large enterprise class system, there is a, a heck of a lot of integration work that needs to be done and is, is currently being done. However, ultimately, the intention will be that Yammer will just provide that social um, element across all of Microsoft's technologies. So we'll, we'll have that as a, a common social platform. And then, uh, as far as I understand, that will also use the same authentication models that we have in Office 365 and other applications. So that will become a, a seamless entity. When that happens, we don't know. Um, there is, Microsoft does promote uh, some of the roadmap uh, online, so it's good to have a look at that and just follow. But I think we can expect it. It's going to take some time because, you know, there's a, a lot of work to do there. So moving into my main area of expertise, which is really around SharePoint Online, uh, I'll just have a quick look at what that includes. Uh, so basically, SharePoint Online gives us site collections. Uh, for those people who are familiar uh, with SharePoint and happy with the terminology, um, a lot of the content that we work with tem t tends to sit around the site collection level. So we can just provision site collections and lots of site collections um, as, as we need, and um, we get, um, I think we can have up to 10,000 of those is our current, uh, current limit. Um, again, these numbers may change, um, they may have changed already, because it changes so quick, so you have to keep your eye on that. Uh, they also give us a, a bunch of SharePoint supporting services, so we get a search capability, uh, so we can define our own search settings in there. Um, again, it's slightly restricted, just down to the way that SharePoint was written, um, some of the components um, don't fit in a multi-tenant scenario very well. So if that's, as an example, within search, we don't get the ability to create custom content sources. Uh, so we couldn't go and point it to our, um, our CRM solution and index that in SharePoint Online. There's just a few limitations to be aware of when you look at these cloud solutions. We also go to business connectivity services. Uh, so what we can do is we can actually use BCS to connect to our line of business applications. And actually, then we can use search to index those BCS connections if we wanted to uh, surface that content. Uh, we also get a secure store. Uh, this allows us to um, securely store uh, usernames and passwords that we might want to use in BCS connections or in uh, other bits of code that we write. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we get a managed metadata service application, so we can have um, a, a, ta a corporate taxonomy and a set of keywords and tags that we want to use across all of our site collections in the SharePoint. We get the ability to create info path forms. Um, this is uh, not a dirty word, despite what a lot of people may think. Yes, it's deprecated, but it's still supported through, SharePoint, uh, through 2023, uh, through SharePoint 2010 and 2013. So. Um, Microsoft is working on a new forms platform at the moment. That's still early days, and we're still getting um, the ability to comment on what that's going to look like. So at the moment, we don't have a fully featured um, forms platform going forward. We have a few different um, elements, such as Excel surveys or access apps or info platforms. So we still have the ability to create info platforms, and uh, that sh you shouldn't be too scared to use those um, if they suit your business purposes. Uh, we get user profiles, so every user can have their own profile page uh, akin to their LinkedIn or Facebook profile, which gives general information about them. Uh, it also forms the basis of a really powerful staff search and a skill search. We get records management, and we get OneDrive for business. So this is um, people's uh, area for um, storing their, we say personal files. Um, obviously, we don't mean non-business files. Um, well, you can store whatever you like in there if you want to allow them to do that. But this is their personal storage area, which is akin to their My Documents area, or in more cases than not, their, their desktop. We also have the SharePoint and the Office app model. Uh, so as developers, we have the ability to create apps that we can plug into SharePoint online. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those really through this session. Uh, a few uh, additional things we get. So we automatically get a search site created for us. You automatically get a content type. Of, I'm not going to go into details of these because it's not the uh, focus of this session. Uh, an app catalog. So we can actually decide what apps we want to make available to, uh, to the business. 
Uh, we also get the ability to create a public website um, in Office 365, so if you wanted to, you could actually host your public website there. Um, it's basic, it's limited, it does work. My own website is currently hosted on the public website here, um, so if it fits into uh, what you want to do, then to be honest, it works quite well. Um, you can customize it and brand it um, you know, pretty well, as you can see on my own website. Um, but if you want a fully sort of fledged interactive website, then it may not quite go that far yet. So some of the things we need to think about when we're looking at um, uh, some of the administration areas, we get all the usual administration screens in Office 365 uh, that we get on premises. Um, and we also get the ability to administer it with PowerShell. But again, because we're considering um, should we go to the cloud or not, there are some differences. Um, SharePoint on-premises gives us around 774 PowerShell commandlets to control SharePoint 2013 on-premises. Now, I believe this number is still the same, but in SharePoint Online, we get 30. So just 30 commandlets versus 774. So for all those people who are used to using SharePoint on-premises and you love uh, PowerShell because this is how Microsoft's telling us that we should do all of our uh, administration these days, we are highly limited when it comes to do that within Office 365 and SharePoint Online. Um, now, that I do expect will change over time. Again, that number 30 may be out of date. I need to check to see if any more have been released out there. Um, but I think the intention is that that will get more capable as time goes on. So that's something to be aware of um, before we just jump in, how do we administer it effectively. Um, there are some great community efforts going on at the moment and uh, there's some very good developers out there who are actually wrapping some, uh, some SharePoint code into PowerShell commandlets to actually bridge that gap. So we do have a, a community ability to, um, to actually do more to control SharePoint from PowerShell uh, than Microsoft gives us. So there's a couple of links there for you to have a look, uh, a look at them as well. And this is uh, developing all the time. So again, just be aware if you're going to move to Office 365 or the cloud of, of what some of the, uh, the implications are. Another nice touch um, that we have in Office 365 is the ability to assign delegated administrators. Um, so a lot of organizations do work with partners uh, when they're doing their SharePoint uh, environments and um, we certainly have the capability here as well. So what you can do, you can actually invite um, your Microsoft partner into your tenancy as a delegated administrator. By doing that, you give them the ability to log into your administration portal um, to actually make configuration changes on your behalf. Um, you can revoke that access anytime if you want to. Um, now, something to be aware of there is you don't know when they're logging. You don't get reporting when your partner logs into it. So you just think carefully about who your partner is, you know, make sure that you trust them and you're okay with them. Hopefully you do. That's why you've chosen in the first place. Um, but that's a really great service for people like myself to be able to go and uh, administer and, and support my, my customers uh, very easily. It also means you don't have to create a uh, separate user account and pay for additional licenses uh, in your tenancy um, for, for your support people. Okay, so <clears throat> that's kind of a little bit around Microsoft Cloud solutions. Uh, what I want to do, I want to step back from it a little bit and look at um, cloud in general. So uh, let's think about what does the marketing tell you? Um, and this again isn't specifically Microsoft, obviously that's where I live, so this is where I pick most of the, uh, the items out, but I think you could apply this to most cloud providers. Basically, they tell you you're using the cloud. You're using their infrastructure. Therefore, you've got no upfront infrastructure costs. No upfront costs. Great. It's cheap. All you do is you pay a simple per user per month licensing fee. That's it. That's all it costs you. Per user per month. Dead cheap. Um, it's always there. Microsoft offers you a 99.9% .9 uptime guarantee, and they actually financially back that. So if your service is not available for 99.9% .9 of the time, they will give you money back from your licenses that you pay. And they do do this. I have had uh, a check back with a, a small amount um, in the past, so you know they do stand up to it. So it is in their interest to make sure the environment is up you know, all that time. To be honest, when I got that small check back, I didn't even know it had been down. It may have been an hour overnight or something, I don't know, but um, you know, I hadn't even noticed it. So they do put a lot of effort into it and they and 
to get uptime of 99.9% is very difficult. If there's any IT administrators in the audience today, then you'll know that that's quite a high number to, to achieve and a very expensive number to achieve. So, you know, they're making some big claims there. <clears throat> they also say that uh, you can access it anywhere, anytime, on any device. You will save money. It's quick. It's easy. It's idiot-proof. There's no downside to it. It's all cloud. Cloud's amazing. Cloud's magic. Cloud's perfect. Um, it's the future. Microsoft's all in on it, and it's what you should be doing. So if you read the marketing, everything that you see is telling you that you should be going to the cloud. It's your only option. It's what's happening, and it's magic. That's what the marketing tells us. So what does the market not quite make clear to us that we probably need to be aware of? Well, a lot of them are very careful in saying there's no upfront infrastructure costs. Okay, well that might be the case, but there are still a lot of upfront costs that you need to be um, aware of. So if you are going to move to the cloud, you don't just start paying a per user per month fee. You've got to invest some money to actually make it work for you. You've got to invest in things like awareness, education, and training. Um, you have to do this if you bring any new software solution in anyway, but you still have to make that investment when going to the cloud. Some people forget that. Um, you still need to design your cloud environment, so you still need to maybe bring a partner in, do some uh, design on how it's going to work, uh, work for you. Uh, you need to migrate your content to the cloud, so again, just because you sign up to Office 365, it doesn't mean all your content is going to magically appear there. You've got to set it up and get your content in there. Uh, you may also need to invest in faster and more robust internet connectivity. So we're, we're used to having super fast um, 100 megabit, gigabit ethernet networks in our environment, in our offices, and that's how fast people access their information. Now, if you are going to be using cloud providers, you need to go and access that over the internet. Internet connections are typically far slower than gigabyte uh, or gigabit connection, so you need to be aware of, of what you need to do. Also, what happens if your internet service provider goes down and your users lose the ability to connect to that service? Generally, if the organization's internet connection goes down, they're probably struggling with their productivity anyway, but it's just another thing to think about. So maybe you need to uh, take some of those magic uh, monetary savings that you make and invest them back into uh, faster um, internet connections. Maybe you want to uh, uh, double up and have two different service providers, or maybe you need to give people 3G or 4G um, Wi-Fi devices uh, so they can go and access it in the field. So maybe you need to think about how you actually get your data from the likes of Dublin, Amsterdam, America, wherever your cloud provider may be based. Uh, you need to make sure that you have a, an effective internet connection to that service. You may also have to be deprovisioning costs of your external infrastructure, uh, your existing infrastructure. Maybe you need to tear that down and, and get rid of it. There's costs associated to that. You may need some. You may actually need some upfront um, infrastructure as well. So a lot of people who move, or a lot of smaller businesses who move to Office 365, they may be coming from a small business server um, solution. In which case, they have a single server that does their Exchange, their SharePoint, their Link, all of those services. Um, and then they want to move to Office 365. But if they want to do that single sign-on piece, they also need to implement DirSync and ADFS. Now, Microsoft says to be supported, you need two DirSync servers and two ADFS servers. So actually, those guys have now moved from a single server on-premises to four servers on-premises. So actually, we haven't made our uh, on-premises environment better. We've actually made it a little bit worse. Well, four times worse uh, in that, that regard. For larger organizations, that may not be such an issue, but it's something you need to think about. You're also getting into uh, uh, quite a strong vendor lock-in. Um, these cloud providers, um, all of them, they're obviously keen to keep you there. Um, Microsoft actually makes quite good claims about how, they, how you can go and access your information back if you want to export it out of the service, but you can be pretty sure that any cloud provider is not going to make that as easy as possible. So um, it's not in their interest to do so. So you need to be aware that if you are going to change provider in the future, then what's your ability to get your data back? How easy is it uh, to do that? They also don't make um, light of the ability, uh, sorry, of the lack of control in the platform that you have. So when you move to a cloud uh, provider, you give up a lot of control. Um, you basically have no control over what's, uh, what's there. I'll look at this a little bit more detail later on. And in my opinion, you will or you should save money if you do it right. So um, all the, the numbers are there that um, over a medium to long term strategy, I do 
believe that people should be saving money um, compared to hosting their own on-premises environments. And to be perfectly honest, how many businesses actually want to be an IT company that happens to make some widgets or happens to deliver some totally unrelated service? You know, people have to really be strong with um, people have to be really strong with um, with what they're doing to make sure they get that benefit. And you need to make sure you do it right. Get the right people in. And then you know you should see those savings. Um, also, look at how good your Microsoft partner is at setting up and configuring services. Um, this is something that's quite close to my heart. One thing I've noticed um, in the area that I live, there's an awful lot of Microsoft partners who are very good Microsoft partners, and they've been in the industry for quite a long time. But a number of them are coming from the uh, the infrastructure and the the desktop um, background, and they. Um, and they're very good at provisioning and infrastructure and exchange and all those pieces, but they're not really very good at doing SharePoint because they don't have that services background, they don't have that um, that capability in doing information architecture and understanding business. So they can probably get parts of the service set up for you right, but can they do the SharePoint bit right? So maybe you need to look at uh, making sure that you know they have capability in those those areas. Um, I come across a lot of projects where you know, people have been set up on Office 365, it's working great for their email, but they don't really have a, a good understanding of SharePoint. They just happen to have this thing that doesn't quite match the marketing hype that, that they were told. They don't get, haven't got this magic pill that Microsoft said they were, was going to solve all of their information management uh, 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 abilities. So some of the things you need to look at. So when we are um, looking at the cloud provider, we need to look at what they do for service continuity. Um, this is the term used for how an organization ensures that the service is up and running, stable, and complete. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, you can go on to uh, Microsoft's website, uh, TechNet, and you can find out what they do um, to offer service con continuity. So it's quite a good way to decide if you are happy and confident that the cloud service provider um, is going to be up and running for you. So <clears throat> Microsoft says what they do around the areas of redundancy, uh, resiliency, how they distribute their services, what monitoring they have in place, uh, what human backups they have um, uh, there as well. Uh, so yeah, they, they make a lot of um, reference to, to what they do. So hopefully they're kind of buying your trust uh, by sharing this information. But you need to look at this, and even if you're looking at Amazon or Salesforce or Dropbox or anyone else, these are the things that you need to be aware of because it's your information and your business, and it's potentially quite valuable if that's not um, uh, if that's not available. <coughs> Microsoft's also very good, and they uh, they have a, a strong program of continuous learning. So for any incident uh, that occurs uh, on the platform. Uh, regardless of uh, how significant it is, they go through a, a, a very thorough um, post-incident review. So they look at what uh, what the incident was, how it happened, why it happened, and then how they can mitigate that in the future so it doesn't happen again. So what we're seeing is these services are just becoming more and more and more uh, reliable over time. <clears throat> Um, they're also getting better at communicating back. Um, traditionally, Microsoft hasn't been amazing at um, this this kind of communication, but they're getting a lot better. Uh, when you go into the Office 365 administration panel uh, portals, um, there's an awful lot of report uh, reporting on the status of the services, so we can see what services are up, what services are down. Uh, we get information on upcoming um, upcoming changes to the platform, so things that you might be need to be aware of and let your users know. Um, and this is getting better all the time. Uh, I still think there's a a long way that Microsoft can go, uh, but you know I think they're doing a really really good job on um, on communicating back uh, really well. So some of the other things that we need to think about are. Um, around security. Now I headline this trust. Um, there's a very specific reason I do that. Um, the reason is because you've got to trust your cloud provider, whoever it is, Microsoft or Amazon or Google, whoever it's going to be, you need trust. So when we're looking at things like the security, um, if it's an on-premises solution, we can walk into our data centers and we can log on to our servers and we can check that the settings are what we expect them to be and what we're being told they are. We can walk in and we can manually check it. When we go to a cloud provider, we can't do that. We don't get to go and have a look and make sure they're doing what they say they're doing. Therefore, we need a large element of trust that our cloud provider is going to do what they say. When we look at security, do we think our cloud provider is secure? Do we trust that they're secure? 
because we, again we can't see it, we just need to look at what they say they do. Do we trust them with our data? Do we trust that Microsoft or Amazon or Dropbox or Facebook, do we trust that they're not going to go and start looking at our information, indexing it, using it for advertising? Are we going, do we trust that they're not going to sell it to foreign governments? You know, there's a lot of smaller cloud providers as well that um, get a fair bit of traction, but do we know who they are, where they're based, and what their ethics uh, are? Do we trust them? And it's so important. One way of, um, of helping that trust element is around the accreditations or the independent accreditations that the cloud provider has. For example, do they have ISO accreditation? Do they ha are they IL2 or IL3 compliant? So by using these other external agencies who do have the ability to go into their data centers and check they're doing what they say, hopefully those accreditations um, infer some credibility to the provider and you can use that in your, your trust decision. Do they have any recorded security breaches? Now, obviously, we're aware that there's a lot of security breaches that happen in IT systems, things like banks, uh, that don't get reported in mainstream media. So again, do we trust that they're safe and secure? Do we trust that they've had no breaches? Or if they have, that they, uh, they've taken, uh, taken conditions to make sure it doesn't happen again? Do we trust them? Do we trust what we're hearing about them? Also decide what level of security you actually need. Um, I do find a lot of organizations um, think that their information is the most important content in the entire world, and the world would probably fail if their information got, um, you know, got lost. Now, for a lot of companies, that's not actually the case. I don't really care. If somebody found my invoices for my company, it would be a little bit embarrassing, but it wouldn't actually cause the world to stop and my business wouldn't uh, be wouldn't fall apart because of it. So therefore, I think the level of security that is provided is perfectly adequate for myself. Now, some other companies I do work with, they have uh, research and development and some very advanced research and development and paint and pending type research going on, um, and it is highly, highly sensitive. So they need to make the decision based on their own content and also things like law firms who have uh, client information and personally identifiable information. Um, they need to make their own decisions on whether they trust their cloud provider to be uh, secure enough to hold that information. And also have a look at, do you actually think you could do a better job at securing your own data? So in a lot of terms, just because something's in your firewall doesn't necessarily mean it's more secure. I can pretty much guarantee that most uh, hackers and attackers could probably get into corporate systems a lot easier than they could into an Office 365 data center. So again, you need to evaluate uh, where your information is most secure and how much you trust them. Big elements on privacy and data protect protection. So do you know where your data is? Uh, do you know what the laws of the land are in the location where your data is stored? Do you know what capabilities um, the things like local governments may have? Um, have you read the small print of your service provider's terms and conditions? Um, I can pretty much guarantee that 95 or maybe higher people who sign up to Office 365 do not read the terms and conditions or any provider. Uh, there's actually, I was reading about a test in, um, I think it was in central London, where a security firm set up a, a free Wi-Fi hotspot um, as a test. And to access it, people had to agree to the terms and conditions. And one of the terms and conditions they put in there, as a bit of comedy value or to prove a point, was that by signing those terms and conditions, you agree to give over your uh, firstborn child for now and eternity. And people just blindly agree to it because they don't read it and they have no idea. Now, obviously, I don't think the security firm will hold anyone to that, but it proves the point that if you don't know what's in those terms and conditions, you don't know what people can do with it. Uh, Facebook was famous recently because they changed their terms and conditions to say that they can use any of your um, images or your posts in their own marketing. Well, if I've got my posts private to just my friends or certain groups, I don't want Facebook to be able to go and do that. I need to be aware of what's in the terms and conditions and what the providers can do with my, uh, my content. Also look at who owns your data and what they can do with it. Okay, can they sell it to people? Can they use it for advertising? Can they mine it? Be aware of PRISM, safe harbor rules. Okay, and some questions. Just think about, again, how private is your data really? Are hackers really going to be interested in getting at it? You know, and can, they, can your cloud provider provide at least the same level of privacy control that you can do yourself? Chances are they can probably do more, but you need to ask yourself these questions before offloading your information to somebody else. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about PRISM, uh, some general information here. I think it's obviously been very, um, very popular in the media recently, or over the last year or two. Um, 
is operated by the uh, US NSA. Um, so again, think about um, if you're hosting your information with an American organization, then what rights does that give the US government to actually access that content? Um, also, another thing to bear in mind as well is even if you are hosting your own content in your own data centers, uh, let's say you have a data center in London and your offices are in Manchester um, in the UK, then actually your, your um, connections to that data may still go via America. One thing people don't realize is that a, a connection over the internet will take the cheapest path to its endpoint and not the, most, not, fi not the physically most direct path. So actually, your communications with your own servers in your same country could still be going all the way over to American um, uh, routers and then back again. So actually, you know, your information is still flowing through the US. So what, uh, what access does that give the US government uh, on things like uh, PRISM? So you need to be aware of these. Again, that's not necessarily a cloud one. That's something just to do with the um, internet connectivity in general. You need to be aware of things like EU safe harbor rules. Um, I actually need to update this slide. This uh, EU, US EU safe harbor has been superseded by a new, um, uh, some new legislation, so I need to update this slide. But you need to be aware of uh, what that allows. So what does this mean for your, uh, for your business? Uh, I've got some slides here on just what their general principles Rules are so. This is uh, what organises the uh, safe harbour principles. Uh, I won't go through this in detail, but it's here for reference, and uh, I think you can get my slides later on. So a key one to look at is um, control. Uh, a big element is well, since we've been running all our own um, uh, our own IT environments on premises, we have full control. We can turn things on, turn things off. We can upgrade uh, things when we want to. We can stall upgrades as well uh, when we want to if we have some incompatibilities. When we move to a cloud provider, we give up that control. We have no control over what gets put on that, uh, that environment, or at best, very limited control. So what does that mean to you as a business? What are the potential implications? If you're writing lots of applications or putting lots of branding onto your, um, your uh, service provider's um, software, then what happens if they make a change? What happens if that breaks um, your customizations? You have no control over uh, restricting that happening. So how do you manage that? What warning and communication does uh, the cloud service provider give you? So Microsoft, as we said before, is getting better at publishing out the roadmap of services they're delivering into it. There's a really good website now where they're telling you what they're currently working on, what's ready for release, what's currently being released. Um, you have the ability, ability to turn on the first release um, into your Office 365 tenancy. So you could have a, uh, a test tenancy somewhere we have first release on, and then you get um, visibility of those new features before they get rolled out uh, and gen made generally available. So that's something you need to be aware of. Uh, so you can get that, um, that visibility of what's coming. Also, what support um, capability is offered by them? So what SLAs do they have? So if something does happen to the service, uh, then what support do you get? How fast does uh, Microsoft support respond to you if you need that, that support? Do you need to investigate a, a partner to help you with some support as well? You need to think about the cost benefits. So again, as we said before, the marketing tells you that um, the, the cloud is magic and you will automatically save money. No, maybe, maybe not. You need to do your own um, cost benefit analysis on that and make sure that cloud is the right solution for your business. So you need to look at um, comparisons of, uh, of the two scenarios. So some of the other ones as well, uh, things to think about as well is, you know, do you want to focus on running your company as opposed to running the IT for your company? So there's a whole lot of uh, not just the cost of uh, renewing um, servers every five years and employing IT support staff. You know, there's more benefits there um, that you might you might find. So you need to do a full evaluation on whether it's actually going to work out for you, and if you and also decide on whether you're looking to make those um, those cost savings over a a short term, a medial term, or a long term. So you know, look at where you are going to make those cost savings if you're going to make them um, and when. 
A nice thing to look at as well, which some businesses find important, is the ability to shift a lot of your um, your spend from capital expenditure to operational expenditure. So for the business people in the room, um, this can be quite a big benefit. Um, when we're looking at capital expenditure, we go out and spend an awful lot of money on some very expensive service. We put them in, and then we actually kind of write down the, the tax on those over a number of years as they do get um, slowly deprecated. Actually, because we're now paying money to a service provider, uh, we are using those services within the, the monthly or the quarterly period uh, that they're paid. So actually we get to um, uh, manage our, our tax and costs associated with operational expenditure a lot better. So that can be um, a, a lot of interest for a lot of businesses. So see how that fits in your own, uh, your own business. A few little things to think about just before we tie up and then there might be a few minutes for questions at the end. Um, you need to think about content migration. You've got your content on-premises currently, how are you going to get that to the cloud? Uh, we have these issues with on-premises uh, services normally anyway, but we have the extra issue of um, how do we move 300 terabytes of information to a cloud service provider over a gigabit LAN, we could probably manage something like that um, over the internet, it's probably a lot more difficult. So how do we manage our content migration? Connectivity, we've mentioned this already. Um, do we have sufficient internet connectivity in our offices and our mobile users to connect to that um, service provider? Um, also, what if we want to uh, connect our cloud services back to on-premises line of business applications? Is that possible? Do we have access internally that those services can uh, connect to? What features does our cloud service have? have? Does it have the features that we need um, and does it support what we want to do? Again, normally we uh, on-premises we have the ability to generally extend these a lot easier. On cloud services we maybe don't have quite as much control over extending it in the way we might want to. So we are stuck with the features that we are given and we are stuck with the features that we are given in the future whether we like them or not. Uh, customization, so uh, a lot of people uh, tend to customize their Microsoft products and SharePoint specifically. So how do we develop our customizations for Office 365? How do we deploy them? How do we test them? How do we support them? Um, what third party support contracts are, are in place? So what happens if we employ a partner to develop a customization for us? Microsoft changed the platform that breaks that customization. That third party uh, support contract is likely to have a clause in there saying that if the Office 365 platform uh, breaks the code that they have written, they will not be liable to support it and they won't, support it, uh, they won't support it for free. I think that's perfectly valid and that's what we do. So you just need to be aware of your, uh, your relationships with your partners as well who are doing these customizations. And the last slide as well, and there's not a lot of detail on this. Um, a lot of people have been speculating, does it mean the end of the IT Pro? What does this mean for your, um, your IT staff? Um, if we are moving a lot of our IT and server infrastructure from our on-premises data centers into the cloud, then what does that mean for the staff that we have in our business? Are they going to lose their job? Do they need to think about uh, retraining? Um, obviously, you know, if, if we have exchange engineers, they can still support and manage exchange. They're just not worrying about changing the hard drives and processors and things like that. So we need to think about what does it mean by us people who are IT pros and also as business owners, um, what are we doing to support our staff through this transition if they are going to be losing their jobs? Can we retrain them or are we, are we making them redundant? So there's a lot of things that you need to think about. Um, there's probably an awful lot more you need to think about as well than I've covered here, uh, but this is just the, uh, the results of the conversations I tend to have with, uh, with my customers. Um, so that's, that's my presentation, that's me done. Um, I think there's probably about five, ten minutes left uh, uh, if there's any questions, so Declan. Um, Thank you, Mark, for a great presentation. You've done a fantastic job um, because I actually don't have any questions for you at the moment, so uh, that means you've obviously okay. answered everyone's questions. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I will add, though, is, um, actually, we just had one question there asking, uh, will the slides and the recording be available, and we'll, we'll make them uh, available to all attendees. Yeah. Um, so now I'm just going to wrap up. So thank you all again for joining us today for this webinar. Don't forget to join us October 15th for the second webinar in the Ultimate Cloud Series with, when Ben Robb, We'll be discussing the challenges in building out a hybrid on-prem Office 365 solution. To register and find out more about this webinar, go to bit.ly forward slash Ben Rob.
ask a little bit about the organizers. Avpoint is the established leader in enterprise class cloud compliance, data governance and management software solutions for next generation social collaboration platforms. For information on Avpoint, go to www.avpoint.com. The European SharePoint Conference is the largest event covering SharePoint and Office 365 technologies in Europe. And we have some big news coming soon regarding our 2015 dates and location. Make sure to keep tabs on the conference website, www.sharepointeurope.com, to stay up to date with the latest developments. Goodbye for now, and I hope to see you all soon.